Oh, hi folks. Welcome to episode three of Principles of Kinesiology. I just got back from my afternoon run. What? I always wear a lapel mic taped to my shirt when I go running. Don't you? Yeah, who's the weirdo? You know, we place an awful lot of demand on our legs every day. For an active person, besides the nutritional demands, it can be quite a job to make sure that our legs remain healthy and happy. So for all you out there, it becomes all the more important you understand how your leg works and what kind of problems you could run into. Anatomical variations and injuries are common. So let me take some time and tell you all about the leg. Roll the intro. As our previous video ended with the foot and ankle, our next videos, including this one, will continue our trend upward, beginning with the calf and knee. The calf is made up of two main muscles, the gastrocnemius and the soleus. Stretching for these muscles must be done in two ways because of the different places of attachment. On the right, you'll see a depiction of a flexed leg so that the different muscles are exposed. At the top, you can see the two heads of the gastrocnemius, and below, a vague outline or an indication of where the soleus, the deep, larger muscle of the calf, is located. Normally, the soleus is not exposed because it is a deep muscle and hidden by the gastrocnemius. As I mentioned, stretching these two muscles requires two different forms of stretching. Both are very important for healthy muscles in the calf and for a healthy hamstring. Stretching these muscles involves both hyperextension of the ankle and flexion of the knee in alteration. An easy way to do this is to use a raised platform such as a stair, putting pressure on the toe so that the ankle folds backwards in hyperextension while straightening the knee will allow you to stretch the gastrocnemius. The same anatomical alignment involving a bent knee will allow you to stretch the soleus. There are many variations and conditions that can result from your unique anatomy around the shin and knee joints. Tibial torsion is one of the most common. With the feet in parallel, the knees are turned to face inward. When knees are facing forward, the feet are turned outward. This puts the patella in poor alignment with the rest of the knee structure. The patella pulls towards the outside and over the lateral condyle of the femur. Friction builds up scar tissue, which grinds and leads to chrondomalacia. Athletes with this structural condition have a greater tendency for shin splints, tendonitis, and pronated feet, which can cause various conditions and compensations, as mentioned in the previous video covering the foot. As an athlete or movement artist, it's very important for you to get familiar with the shape and structure of the knee joint. The knee is a fairly simple joint in that it performs a very straightforward action, but it is also an extremely vulnerable joint and susceptible to many types of injuries, which can be aggravated because of various anatomical variations. The variations of the knee are genuverum, genuvalgum, patella alta, tibial torsion, and genurecurvation. In this illustration, we see an example of a normal pair of legs, followed by a bow-legged description, or vergus, and knock knees on the far right, or valgus. Genurecurvation is sometimes referred to as hyperextension of the knee and will be illustrated later. Patella alta, or high patella, can also be somewhat common and has its own set of unique issues. A person with patella alta may have a greater tendency for patella dislocation. Also, the rubbing of the patella against the lower condyles of the femur may cause a buildup of calcium deposits, scar tissue, and create rough surfaces. This variation in anatomy, called genurecurvation, or hyperextended knee, is usually caused by two loose ligaments holding the knee joint together. This allows the knee joint to then fall back into a sway position. 
Individuals with this type of variation are more susceptible to ligament and cartilage injuries. They should pay close attention to landings after a jump. Hyperextension can also come as a result of injury or from a traumatic force or blow impacting the front of the leg while extended. Knee injuries can affect any of the ligaments, tendons, and fluid-filled sacs called bursa surrounding your knee joint and the bones, cartilage, and ligaments that form the joint. For example, there are four ligaments around the knee, one on each side and two inside called the ACL and PCL, posterior and anterior cruciate ligaments. A tear in one ligament caused by a fall or contact trauma is likely to cause immediate pain that worsens when you try to walk or bend your knee, a popping sound, an inability to bear weight on the injured knee, or a feeling that the knee might buckle or give way. There are many things to consider in the way of tendon injuries. Tendonitis is irritation and inflammation of one or more tendons, the thick fibrous cords that attach muscle to bones. Athletes such as runners, skiers, and cyclists are prone to develop inflammation in the patellar tendon, which connects the quadricep muscles on the front of the thigh to the larger lower leg bone, the tibia. Symptoms include pain in one or both knees, swelling in the front of the knee or just below the kneecap, worsening pain when you jump, run, squat, or climb stairs, or an inability to completely extend or straighten your knee. The meniscus is a C-shaped piece of cartilage that curves within your knee joint. Meniscus injuries involve tears of the cartilage, which can occur in various places and configurations. Signs and symptoms include pain, mild to moderate swelling that occurs slowly, as long as 24 to 36 hours after the injury, an inability to straighten the knee completely. The knee may also feel locked in place at times. Bursitis. Some knee injuries cause inflammation in the bursa, the small sacs of fluid that cushion the outside of your knee joint so that the tendons and ligaments glide smoothly over the joint. Bursitis can lead to warmth, swelling, redness, pain, even at rest, aching or stiffness when you walk, considerable pain when you kneel or go up and down stairs, fever, pain, and swelling if the bursa located over your kneecap bone, known as the pripatellar bursa, becomes infected. In the case of a dislocated kneecap, this occurs when the triangular bone, the patella, that covers the front of your knee slips out of place, usually to the outside of your knee. You'll be able to see the dislocation and your kneecap is likely to move excessively from side to side. Signs and symptoms of a dislocated kneecap include intense pain, swelling, difficulty walking or straightening your knee, and an obvious disfigurement of the front shape of your knee. Several other conditions and symptoms should be considered. Loose body. Sometimes injury or degeneration of bone or cartilage can cause a piece to break off and float in the joint space. This may not create any problems unless the loose body interferes with knee joint movement leading to pain and a locked joint. Sometimes nutrition should be considered. Osgood Slaughter's disease, primarily affecting athletic teens and preteens, this overuse syndrome causes pain, usually worse with activity, especially running and jumping. It also causes swelling and tenderness at the bony prominence, the tibial tuberosity, just below the kneecap. This condition is usually manifest by the formation of an overdeveloped tibial tuberosity. Chrondomalasia, also known as patellofemoral syndrome, this is a general term that refers to pain arising between your patella and the underlying thigh bone, the femur. It's common in young adults, especially those who have a slight misalignment of the kneecap. In athletes and in older adults who usually develop the condition as a result of arthritis of the kneecap, it causes pain and tenderness in the front of your knee that's worse when you sit for long periods, when you get up from a chair, and when you climb or descend stairs. A grating or grinding sensation may be present when you extend your knee. Lab number three. With a partner, assess your knees. Observe the patella and look to see if there is any torsion of the tibia. Have you had a previous or current injury to your knee that still bothers you? Palpate the knee joint to identify the bony landmarks and try to determine what the problem might be, if any, based on your knee knowledge. Identify any anatomical differences in the knee or compensations. 
Do your knees face inward or outward? Are they sway? Try and assess what sort of strengths or weaknesses the different knee structure may have. 